Good morning. If you would all try to find a seat, I know that um, it's a little crowded, but we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a pretty full program today. I'm Samantha Schnee. I am a translator and founding editor of Words Without Borders. I am very excited to welcome you to this year's Literary Translation Center, which we're going to kick off with a panel about what works in promoting international literature. We have three excellently qualified guests to speak to us about this topic today. And we're also celebrating English Pen's Writers in Translation Committee's 10th anniversary today. So the books that they've chosen to highlight in their presentations are all books that have been have won an award from the English Pen Writers in Translation program. So I'd like to start by introducing my guests to you. In the middle, we have Nikki Prasa. She's an independent PR consultant with 13 years experience working within publishing. She began her career at Headline before joining Quirkus Books, where she was responsible for the Stieg Larsson Millennium Trilogy campaign, also known as The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. She went on to become head of publicity for McElhose Press, where she promoted a range of English pen writers, English pen writers and translation supported titles, authors and translators, including The Armies by Evelio Rosero, Yalo by Elias Khoury, School Blues by Daniel Pennack, Beauty and the Inferno by Robert Saviano, Where I Left My Soul by Jerome Ferrari. Most recently, she worked on Sworn Virgin by Elvira Dones and By Night the Mountain Burns by Juan Tomas Avila Laurel, both published by the not-for-profit independent publishing house and other stories. In 2013, she set up Silver Birch PR, specializing in promoting literature and translation and independent publishing. At the end, we have Bethan Jones. Bethan is the publicity director at Harville Secker, Penguin Random House. Harville Secker specializes in publishing quality international writing with a wayward streak. And Bethan works with prize-winning authors from around the world, including Haruki Murakami, Yo Nesbo, Karl Ovignausgaard, Andre Kurkov, Yasmina Reza, and Umberto Eco. And then closest to me, we have Alex Zucker, who has translated novels by Czech authors Yachim Topol, Miloslava Holubova, Petra Hulova, and Patrick Orednik. He currently serves as co-chair of the Pen America Translation Committee. Among the honors he has received are an English Pen Award for Writing and Translation, a National Endowment for the Arts Literary Fellowship, and the Alter National Translation Award. In 2014, he created new subtitles for the digitally restored version of Closely Watched Trains, the 1966 Czechoslovak New Wave classic based on the Bohumil Hrabal novella. His translation of Heda Margulis Kovali's Innocence, or Murder on Steep Street, will be out from Soho Press in June 2015. Love Letter in Cuneiform, his translation of Tomasz Zmeskal's first novel, is forthcoming in 2016 from the Margellos World Republic of Letters series at Yale University Press. Alex lives in Brooklyn, New York. So we'll get Alex to start us off with a couple of examples, and then we'll move on. And at the end, we'll definitely have some time for Q&A. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. OK, I'm not too close to the mic. Hello. Uh, so I first want to thank um, English Pen for um, having me here and for uh, granting the award to this uh, novel, which I translated. It was, and I want to thank Portobello. I don't know if, uh, is Ann Meadows here today, or my editor on the book? Well, anyway, so uh, Joachim Topol is a Czech author, and this was the uh, third book of his that I translated. It was published by Portobello Press here in the UK in 2013. I think it was June 2013. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about what I did to uh, essentially to amplify the impact of the English Pen Award, which was uh, given to support promotion of the book here in the UK. Um, so here you see um, 
this is the page, obviously, of the book on the Portobello website. But what I did was I uh, created a blog for the book uh, because in addition to whatever um, publicity I was doing for the book via social media, Facebook and Twitter, the thing about those posts, obviously, is they're there and they're gone. Whereas if you create a blog, uh, you can Facebook and tweet the blog posts, but the blog is always there for people to refer back to. So... Um, All right, so this is just as typical. I mean, what I'm going to show you here today is not rocket science or anything. Um, it's, it's pretty basic, um, but again, it's about uh, how can I amplify what's already being done. Uh, so, for instance, when the book won the, um, the English Pen Award, I do a little blog post about it. It's pretty simple with a link. You can see the links. Uh, also, I did the blog, I mean, I'm not going to claim any kind of design expertise, but the book cover, as you saw, was mainly black and red, so I have a black and red theme on the blog. Again, the other thing I want to point out is that um, if you see the URL, the nice thing about creating a blog is the blog's, the URL is the Devil's Work Workshop Yaking Topol blogspot.com, so when you search uh, the name of the book or the name of the author, this is likely to be one of the first things that comes up, which is the beauty of a blog. You create your own URL. So, um, one, whoops, I went back. Um, how do I go back one? Oh, I see, I found it. Okay. So, one nice thing about uh, a book receiving the English Pen Writers in Translation Award is that they also feature um, uh, it on the, the blog of the English Pen website. So in addition to the, the book having received the award, I was asked to translate a story um, by Topol, which was featured on Pen Atlas. Um, again, also you'll notice I found photographs of the author. Uh, I always credited them when there, were, when there was a credit available. Um, so that you know, people got a chance to see what he looked like. Oh, so you'll notice here in this blog post, for instance, I'm also promoting that he was going to the the award that English Pen gave the book was used mainly to bring Joachim Topol over here to the UK, where he appeared at European Literature Night uh, with Rosie Goldsmith at the British Library, and then also at the Hay Festival in Wales. So in this post. In addition to saying that um, the story is up on Penn Atlas, I'm announcing that he's going to be appearing at the British Library with a link to whatever stories there were. Uh, this was the post when the book was, the book obviously was published by UK publisher, but then it was released in the US, so I did a little blog post to mark that. Again, I have a photo. Uh, here you'll see already it's gotten a couple of reviews, so I'm looking to the reviews there. Um, you know, one thing that I've learned is uh, that reviewers are always looking for information about the book in addition to whatever they can find on the publisher's website. So the more that you can give them to go on, the better. Um, in addition to the links to the reviews, I found some, you know, older interviews with Topol that had appeared in English on the web, and those are in the link list as well. Uh, so here, um, is a video, which is great, you know, if your author appears in public and there's a video record of it. Um, so I, I, I put it on the website and, uh, you know, have a screenshot. There he is talking with Rosie Goldsmith. One thing I did, which, of course, not everybody's going to do, is I actually transcribed the interview. Uh, you see the beginning of it there, and that, you know, took me a whole day to do, but I think it was worth it because, again, some people might not have time to watch the video, but they can read the transcript, and again, when you have a transcript, people can find it via Google. They can find all the references in it. Um, so then here was um, Topol's appearance at the Hay Festival with uh, the author Tan Tuan Eng talking with Joe Glanville. So, um, and you can't see it here, but I have the link to the audio of the photos, and then, again, I have a transcript of the entire uh, conversation. Um, this is more to show on the, on the right-hand side there, um, the links. And, um, again, you know, I'm doing what I can with what I have to work with. The book was called The Devil's Workshop, so I didn't just say links, I called them The Devil's Links, you know. A anything to get people's attention. Uh, so at this point, you can see there's a list of the reviews and, and uh, you know, when it was nominated for various awards and so on. 
Um, and then most recently, the book actually was nominated for the Impact Dublin Award, which is, uh, you know, libraries nominate the book for that. So it's had a, a you know, a long life, this book, and I, I'm sure that some of it has to do with um, the book having won the English Pen Award. Um, you know, I did look at, you know, you may be wondering, so how, how do I measure the impact of this? Well, I, I can't measure the impact of this. I don't know to what extent um, my creating this blog uh, increased the sales of the book. Um, I can look at the, you know, analytics for the page and see how many people visited it, but that doesn't tell me. I don't have any way to see if anybody went from this and, and bought the book. Although I do have a link for people to buy the book from their local bookstore. You can see that's at the top of the devil's links. Um, and um, I think that's really about it. Again, I, I want to say I don't think this is rocket science, but um, and different translators have different uh, uh, opinions about how much they want to put into publicizing the book, but I felt like this was a real opportunity. This was a sort of a breakthrough um, opportunity for Joachim Topol as an author, and again, I'd been, done two books by him before, so I really wanted to, to do as much as I could to get the word out, and I'll be happy to take any questions. But that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Um, okay, can you all hear me? Yeah, good. Hi, uh, I'm Nikki and um, I work as a freelance PR and I'm going to be talking about um, By Night the Mountain Burns by uh, by Juan Thomas Avila, La, 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 I can't pronounce this, Laurel, Laurel. Um, he is a, an Equatorial Guinean writer and activist. Uh, the book was translated by Jethro Sutar, published by And Other Stories, and uh, has been recently shortlisted for the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, which we're very pleased about. Um, Basically, the reason why this, uh, this campaign was so successful was uh, due to a combination of things. Um, mainly, we had a new story. Uh, in 2011, um, Juan Thomas went on a month-long hunger strike, uh, protesting against the, um, the corruption and the brutality of his uh, country's regime. Um, this led to temporary exile, which I was then able to sort of go to the, the media and talk to them about. Uh, the story had already been reported in international media, so by the time we published, people were sort of already aware of who he was. Um, uh, we had, basically, up until that point, uh, he had been the only author in Equatorial Guinea uh, to not have gone into exile. So, you know, the fact that he'd had to go into exile sort of made like a, a personal, um, uh, like a very strong personal point to this story, which, uh, which I think people actually sort of resonated with. And I think basically when it comes to pu publicizing a, um, a book, more than, more than just pushing a product, I think if you can get people to buy into another person and their cause and their struggle, um, you have a much, much greater chance of success because people sort of empathize with another person as opposed to just another product. Um, so you also have a unique setting. Uh, Equatorial Guinea is not necessarily a place that many people know about. Uh, this is only the second book to come out of Equatorial Guinea. Um, uh, uh, translated into English, obviously. And, um, and the book itself was set on a remote island off the coast of Africa where Juan Thomas actually grew up. So there was a very sort of personal element to the story as well. Um, and basically the translator, the translator was absolutely key when it came to this campaign. And I find that translators often actually are. Because most of the time, you know, first of all, I don't speak the language that the, that the author writes in or speaks in. So I can't communicate with him. So I have to do that through the translator. Um, this particular book came to us through Jethro, who was uh, passionate about it. So he'd already been talking to his networks about this book before it was published. So that's people like translators, uh, journalists, and, you know, friends. Um, people in the publishing industry 
He then brought it to us through our international reading groups, um, which focus on specific languages. Uh, there's a selection of titles and basically this was picked out of that selection of Spanish titles by the members of that reading group, which is open to anybody. It's not, you know, it's not uh, limited, so, you know, anyone can join. Um, and they actually chose this particular book as one that they felt and other stories should publish. It fit with our list, so we decided, yeah, okay, we'll do it. Um, and that was already a fan base from which we could work from, which was, you know, quite unusual, but, um, but really good. Um, and then uh, the fact that basically Jethro was available all the time, you know, I, I didn't have access to the author, but I did have access to Jethro. He didn't go off and disappear for days on end. He was always on the end of an email. So whenever I needed him, he was there and able to respond very quickly. And that basically became quite crucial when um, in February 2014, uh, Alvila Laurel had to disappear again. He basically went underground. Um, he had been targeted by his uh, government's uh, security forces. Um, basically, he had... Um, he had applied to be part of a group uh, that was going to have a sit-in protest um, against police brutality. Uh, obviously, the security forces didn't like this at all, so they basically uh, threatened to um, detain him without charge. So he had to go underground. We couldn't get hold of him, and this was pretty serious. Jethro was a little bit worried because, you know, we hadn't heard from him in a while. So um, when we found this piece that came up by David Shook on the LA uh, Review of Books blog, uh, it kind of explained the whole situation to us and we realized that, that you know, he was, he was gone, we couldn't find him. So basically, we were concerned about his security. We were then able to uh, contact um, uh, The Guardian and also English Pen uh, who then let Jethro write pieces about what had actually happened for their blogs. And I think the important thing about these blogs is that, you know, whilst it's not in the actual physical newspaper, um, the internet sort of reaches everywhere. So, you know, in terms of international publicity, I, I think the internet is far more important than actually getting a story in a newspaper. You know, if you can get it on their blog, you're reaching everybody. Whereas if you get it in a newspaper, you know, it's a finite sort of um, audience that you're actually getting to. And obviously, the, um, the, both the Guardian and the uh, Pen, Atlas Pen blogs um, have massive, massive readerships. Uh, and other stories joined a, uh, a media monitoring company last year uh, called Crimson Hexagon and um, we, we were monitoring a few sort of different uh, themes and we basically looked at literature and translation and what came out was that uh, English Pen and Pen Atlas had the broadest reach around the world for this particular subject. So anyone interested in anything to do with literature and translation is probably going to come across English Pen and Pen Atlas at some point. So if you can get something in there, then you have a much larger chance of, or much greater chance of reaching people um, and talking about the subject that you're actually, um, that you're passionate about. Um, okay, so... Going back to social media, this is basically how we engage with our audiences. Um, and, you know, and, and basically we're actually talking to uh, a growing amount of intelligent and engaged readers who are interested in literature and translation, translation which I've actually noticed you know, since I've started working in literature and translation, you know, the, the interest in this subject and this field has, has really grown. You know? quite considerably. Um, so social media sort of really helps us kind of engage with our audiences uh, as well as tell them what we are doing and why it's so important. So uh, by the time the second news story hit, we were able to not only champion our book, 
but we were also able to, um, uh, rather our author, but we were also able to champion our book. And the way And Other Stories works is eight months before publication, we start sourcing um, uh, subscriptions for the actual books to be published. So we don't, we can't publish the books without people's support in the first place. So when this story happened, we were then able to sort of say, hey guys, you know, we've got this author, he really needs our help, um, and this is how you can help him. You know, you can spread the word and you can also maybe um, help us publish his book, you know, first time in, in English in, in this country. So we got that, we got the funding, and we also created a community, people who actually felt like they had a part to play in this particular story, which, you know, is actually, I think it's quite, it's quite an important thing to, to be able to sort of draw your audiences in, you know, and sort of say, you know, you're not just a, a reader, you're actually, you're part of this, you're part of the story, and your name then goes in the back of the book, and you sort of feel like, like you have an investment, a personal investment in this whole thing. Um, and, uh, and, and there's nowhere better to do that with, than with social media, you know, I mean, you know, I, I sort of find uh, traditional um, publicity methods these days, you know, the sort of the relying on the, the reviews and the, the interviews, it's, it's great, it really is great, but you don't, you don't have that dialogue, and I think dialogue now, today, is actually really important, it's probably more important than just you know, just getting the information out there. You know, you need to talk to people and you need to, to understand that they know what you're doing and, and, and they support you. Um, and basically as a translator or as a writer or anyone who's kind of trying to get a message across, I would say that, you know, everyone sort of says, you know, social media, social media, and it's very important. But you, mo you might not necessarily feel very uh, comfortable with every single platform. You don't have to, you know, you've already got a large network. You, you know other translators, you know other readers, you, you know, you have your friends. As long as you're talking to those people, that's great. And then just find one social media platform that you're actually comfortable with and make it your own, you know, and you'll find that people who are liking what you do will come and find you. And, you know, and, and that sort of just creates another, just another community that you can be talking to. So. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, just do that. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, Thanks for joining us this morning. I'm Bethan Jones, a publicity director at um, Harvel Secker, which is part of the vintage division at Penguin uh, Random House. Um, I'm really pleased to have been invited here to talk today um, with my fellow panelists about promoting international literature. Um, before I start, I thought I'd give you just a little bit of information about Harvel Secker, um, in case you're not familiar with us. Um, we're pretty unique um, among imprints at large publishing houses in the UK. Um, in that about half of our list every year is made up of literature in translation. We publish fiction um, and non-fiction. Um, this, this slide here shows just a handful of the writers at Vintage that um, we publish, um, but specific to the Harvel Secker list, you can see up here are writers like Umberto Eco, Per Pettersson, Haruki Murakami, Jose Saramago, um, Nagugi Wathiongo, Joan Esbo, um, and of course um, the brilliant Gunter Grass. Now, uh, this is a really quick snapshot of um, some of the writers that we're publishing from around the world in 2015. Um, uh, we're actually publishing, so far we're going to be publishing books in, from 16 different countries. They include Japan, Germany, Iceland, Mozambique, Angola, Holland, just to name a few from this year. Um, a couple of the books that we've published already this year and had some successes with our um, two Norwegian titles, uh, two very different ones, Joe Nesbo, commercial crime writer, and Carlo Viknasgaard, um, his sort of literary uh, installment of his My Struggle Cycle. Um, but I thought before getting into specifics, um, it might be interesting to look at, at Harvel Secker, how we talk to readers. Um, as Nikki was saying, it, it's very, very hard to rely on traditional media these days, and um, what we call the kind of mainstream um, book interviews, book review slots, they're shrinking, they're shrinking massively um, in print. And so 
we turn to online where the opportunities are increasing and often that means you've got an opportunity now to talk directly to your reader so you know while you have we have journalists and we have reviews and we have critics as a sort of intermediary to our readers actually online offers us an opportunity to talk to them directly and to find them online to find what they're reading what they're enjoying what kind of content they'd like what they'd like to hear from us and how we can bring it to them so I thought it might be interesting just to show you a few of the ways that we do this um, at Harvel Secker so as I said we're part of Vintage we have a Vintage branded website but within that we run an international writing blog um, now this is run by um, one of our editors at Harvel Secker Ellie Steele but a host of our editors publicists marketeers and our translators and our authors um, contribute. It's a real content rich site of the website. So we produce um, we run interviews, we have people writing articles about us, we focus on different countries. Every month we have a sort of top five recommendations from different countries. So it's a real hub um, for uh, the books and our writers and generally sort of celebrating stories from around the world. Harvel Secker on Twitter we have, uh, how many do we have? just over 8,000 followers on Twitter um, and we find that this is one of the real key kind of social media spaces for us to talk to our readers um, and to find people and talk to them, people who really care passionately about literature in translation. So um, uh, Alex was talking earlier about sort of um, amplifying what you do online and this is a great way to do that so everything that we do in publishing the book and um, from the moment we get the the book in uh, in the office we're, we're photographing and sharing and tweeting we're sharing news interviews reviews details of events everything to sort of share with a, and grow a community around our books um, and talk directly to readers because visibility and recommendation online are two of the biggest challenges and opportunities um, by uniting and sort of creating a community of readers who love our books, they help us to spread the word. Um, they recommend books to their followers um, online and their friends offline, and it, and it really grows a community and awareness. Um, I thought I'd just give a very small example. Um, we on Twitter we will we'll get involved in um, special celebrations and, and hashtags like Translation Thursday that focus specifically in on international literature. But what we're trying to do more and more now um, is to kind of create these opportunities ourselves, even where you might not initially think that they exist. So um, this is an example from uh, uh, the Olympics uh, a couple of years ago. I just thought it might be um, interesting. We were sort of trying to tap into Olympic fever in 2012, um, and so what we did was run a competition. Petition, um, offering people you, a chance to win a book from the countries that were winning medals and we just ran it every day um, and it got picked up by the press so by the bookseller and uh, the independent on Sunday and I think the Evening Standard as well and, it, 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 and um, we got lots of entries and, and lots of kind of traction online and in the papers which was really nice and it was just it's an interesting way to draw new readers and draw a bit of attention to our list and what we do, the fact that we're a global list and that we publish people from around the world and just to bring new readers to us hooking in to, to, a, to a really big event that sport you might not necessarily associate with international writing but it, it, it worked really well for us. Um, and very quickly, um, I want to mention a podcast. This is a podcast that I founded with a colleague at Vintage. Um, and it was a re it's a really great low budget way to create content. So we bought two very cheap microphones and a mixing desk. And the software we, we, um, we've downloaded is a free software. And we record our authors. Um, we record them, uh, we interview them, we record them reading, and we put it out for free through our own website, on SoundCloud, and uh, on iTunes as well, as an MP3 monthly 30-minute arts program that we edit ourselves. And the brilliant thing about this is that we really don't need to have our authors in the office. Technology means that they can record a short reading or do a short Q&A on their phone, on their laptop, they can email it over to us, we can edit it, we can have it out the next day. Um, and increasingly, we're doing this when we get good news, so whether that's that sort of um, prize news that often can come at the very last minute or sometimes with no notice at all but we can quickly sort of get on the phone get on an email ask them to do as a short reading send them a few questions they can have it with us overnight and we put it out the next day so we just try and be as reactive and immediate as we possibly can be and this is a really great way to do it and people um, we're definitely seeing a real rise in both sort of um, people downloading our audio books but people going to SoundCloud and looking for snippets and bits of audio content so that's a real growing kind of channel for us. Um, 
And I wanted to mention very quickly our Young Translators Prize, in case we have any um, budding young translators in the audience, and also because it's, um, it's a prize that we announce every year at the book fair, and we'll be doing that um, tomorrow night. Um, we run this prize every year, we choose a different language, um, and a panel of judges choose a winner. So we have a panel of judges. We always have an author, um, a literary critic, a translator, and one of our editors at Harvel Secker. Um, the winner wins um, a thousand pounds, a mentorship with a translator in association with the BCLT, uh, participation in the Crossing Border Festival, and also Granta Online published the winning story. So we've been running this for five years now, and um, as I said, we announce at LBF, and then we announce our winner in the autumn, and we work with a real variety of partners, event partners, to put on a big sort of translation slam event with a host of our translators and our winner. We, um, we did it last year with Cheltenham, we've done it previously with Foils, and as I say, um, Grants have come on board and published the story Story. So if there are any budding translators out there, then um, there'll be more news tomorrow on the language for this year and the, uh, the entry opening times. Um, now this slide shows some of the writers um, that have most recently been beneficiaries of the Penn Promotes Grants. And um, Jesus Carrasco and Miyakuto this year. Um, the Penn Grant is so important to us because um, and we're increasingly finding that having the opportunity to bring writers here to the UK to do events, to introduce them to new readers, and to mark the publication of their book really, really carries weight and helps us in terms of building their profile and generating PR for them. Um, without the opportunity to bring them here and do events, we, we lose a huge um, opportunity, really. Um, this is just a selection of the um, events partners that we work with, so it's everything from libraries to bookshops to festivals, um, and we will always um, record the events, however big or small, um, audio or video, so that we give them an online life. So events now, they're not really just about the, the 20, 40, 100, 200 people who might attend. We make sure that we are creating content that then has a life online, and we amplify that. So, you know, one author visit for three days, three events, actually can have a huge impact if we're recording that content, seeding it out, um, as well as the opportunity to do traditional media interviews alongside it. Um, and that's why, you know, Penn Grant is so, so valuable to these authors and to the publication of their books. Um, and I'm just going to end with something. Um, it was one of the sort of highlights of um, our year last year. Um, these are some photos from when we published Haruki Murakami's Colourless Sakuru Tazaki um, in the UK last August. Um, now, I'm sure that Haruki Murakami is a very, very familiar name to everybody here. Um, and you probably think, oh, wow, easy, easy, you know, easy PR. And of course, on many levels it is. But um, there are challenges to publishing a Murakami novel that do make it very similar and relevant to, publish, uh, to publicizing many of the books in translation on our list. So I just thought I'd just take you through this as a very mini case study. Um, you know, we, we wanted to make this one of the big books of the summer. Um, but like many of our writers abroad, Haruki Murakami, he wasn't able to visit on publication. He doesn't give interviews. Now, in this case, this isn't a language issue. That's his preferred choice. But often, we, we often have writers who are unavailable to travel. They might not be able to, um, to speak the language and be comfortable being interviews. And even though we have the support from their brilliant translators and we do as much as we can with the media to get them to, to, um, to work with the translator, it's really, really tough to get mainstream media to interview writers uh, and, and use a translator. It, it's a fact, it is. So we have to find ways to work around that. Essentially, we're often trying to create sort of theatre and magic in bookshops and in the media without the author. And, and, and you know, it, the case was no different here. Um, so, you know, as I said, we all know who Haruki Murakami is, but, you know, trying to get a mainstream national newspaper to write about a sort of cult Japanese novelist in translation beyond the literary pages is still, sadly, a real challenge in the UK, um, especially when he's not here to give interviews and talk for the book himself, and neither, in this case, was his translator. Um, so the idea was to sort of create a news story, create a PR story that would make the book visible across the UK, in bookshop, but would also generate coverage in the news pages 
and amplify it just beyond the books pages and beyond um, the literary press. So we work with booksellers across the UK, um, created um, POS, so posters, balloons, party packs. You can see some of them here and some of the front covers here to help them to build sort of window displays that really acted as our kind of sort of um, front window shot, really, this book being out. Created real theatre in the bookshops. And as part of this, they agreed to open out of hours so that people could get their Murakami novel at midnight. Um, and this, this was the real key, really, because what it enabled us to do from a PR angle was just to go to the sort of news desks at the national newspapers and to go to the BBC and say, look, we have a Japanese writer in translation and bookshops in the UK are opening at midnight and they haven't done this since J.K. Rowling's last Harry Potter novel. So we were able to say, look, you know, it was a real kind of interesting angle for them because, you know, even the Daily Mirror covered it. Now, their readers have never, probably never heard of Murakami, but for them, the fact that this unknown Japanese writer could command that bookshops, you know, across the country were opening at midnight was fascinating to them. So even if they hadn't heard of Haruki Murakami, they wanted to cover the story. Um, of the fact that, yes, you know, could this be the new Harry Potter? Um, but just to sort of really reinforce it and maximise it, we decided to project the front cover on some key London landmarks that you sort of associate with Murakami. So we had the Tate Modern, design is a huge part of kind of Murakami's appeal, the Covent Garden um, Opera House, because music is so central to his work, and then Waterstones Bookshop, um, one of the kind of an icon, uh, iconic building of, of book selling in the UK. Um, and this was really not expensive to do. We did it illegally in a guerrilla kind of way. We hired a man with a van and a projector, and we projected our own front cover on these landmarks and just hoped for the best. So it really didn't cost much money at all, um, a couple of hundred pounds. But what it did was just reinforce to the press that this was a serious thing you know if you're projecting someone on Tate Modern then we need to take this seriously and we did it at midnight so it was a sort of countdown to the tills so we sort of created a package that we just hoped they couldn't ignore um, and they didn't which was brilliant so we had kind of blanket media coverage the next day you couldn't escape the fact that a new Murakami novel was in the shops and this was all without any appearance from Mr Murakami himself thanks Are the mics on? Okay, great. So at this point, I'd like to just take a moment to explain, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Penn Writers in Translation grants, what they are and what they do. Um, there are two tranches. The first, which we're celebrating today, which has existed for the last 10 years, is the Penn Promotes grant. So that's the grant that we've been talking about where we can bring an author to the UK with some financial support from that grant stream. The publishers are the ones who must apply for these grants, but sometimes publishers aren't aware that the grants exist. So it's helpful for translators to be able to say, did you know about this grant and, and have you considered applying for it? Um, there's a second tranche, which is newer, and it's called the Pen Translates Grants. And those grants are specifically to support the cost of the translation. So as you may be pitching a book to a, tr a publisher, um, you can always recommend to them that they apply for funding for the translation of the book, which is a huge cost in many cases. And in many cases, this is a huge boon to the publishers of the books because it really makes a difference to their PNL. I think it's important to point out, if you are having conversations with your editors about that, that the Pen Translation Committee does look more favorably on applications which pay translators fairly. In other words, in line with the observed Translators Association rate. Um, and that if publishers are significantly underpaying translators, then those applications may not be received as favorably as applications for books of equal quality, which have paid the translator favorably. Um, so at this point, I'd like to also open it up to questions, because I'm sure you have many um, about the wonderful expertise you guys have shared with us today. Um, we have a microphone. So if you have a question, would you raise your hand, and we'll get the mic to you so everyone can hear your question. There's one right there. Hi, my name is Terry Laster. I'm a 
German to English translator. And I'm wondering, uh, as, as international publishers, what languages are you most in need of as far as translating translators go? Or is it, is it all, all languages? Which, which is great. That's a good answer, too. <laughs> say most languages but um, when I was with Maclehose Press I remember he used to he used to sort of go on about Dutch um, I don't know why he, I think he used to struggle to find decent Dutch translators um, French translation you know uh, I think there's a lot of competition there you probably don't need to <laughs> yeah you'll have to fight a lot of people um, Italian yeah I don't know um, yeah I think yeah no 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 mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe um, Korean, actually. I think Korean's quite a populist uh, subject at the moment, and I know I, I only actually know one translator who translates from Korean. So um, yeah, just I guess look at the the flow. But I would say choose a language that you actually like, you know, that you want to want to work with, rather than find the language that we need. I, I don't think I'm going to be learning Korean anytime soon, <laughs> but I was just, just curious. In my experience, um, I'm sorry, I can't see you and talk into the mic at the same time. Okay, um, there are some publishing houses that specialize in literatures from certain languages and countries, but uh, other than that, um, publishers are not looking for particular languages to be translated. They're looking for... Um, stories and styles of writing that appeal to them. That's their first uh, consideration. Thank you. Well, we're moving the mic. I'll just echo that and say I, I've never been in a um, meeting where someone says, you know, this year we really, we don't have a French translation on the list. We, we need that French translation. I think it's exactly what um, Alex has said that when editors are looking for work, they're looking for something that um, is original, unique, speaks to them, and they feel will speak to a broader readership as well. Um, I think it's important to note for translators who aren't working from mainstream languages where there's a lot of government support to export that literature into English, that you as a translator need to actually be more proactive and, and play more of a role as a kind of cultural go-between to get that literature out from the language into, into English. And there will be a panel, I don't know exactly when, but on uh, pitching, right? On how to propose um, books to publishers at some point during these three days. There is. Yeah. And it's probably in this, um, the, the seminar guide, if you flip through there, I'm sure it's yeah. in there. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Uh, Martin Goodman from Barbican Press. Uh, we are bringing out a novel in translation from the Czech, in fact, later this year. Uh, we applied for the grants from Penn and from the Czech government, and they, they didn't come through. So essentially, it's been a, a labor of love from people. And um, the, you know, the author, Martin Vopenko, is, is like surrendering some of his royalty to sort of give the translator a chance. But, a great yearning to pay sort of translators' rates, and that's what went through on the proposals. But we cannot afford to do it, you know? and uh, so I just wondered, really, what the economics is without the grants. How do you manage to um, sort of pay the royalty, pay pay in advance, pay the translator the going rates? You know, you're talking, you know, ten grand out already. So I just wondered what the economics are in that strictly commercial sense, outside the labour of love element. Is my mic on? Yeah? No? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> to realize I'm quite short. Um, <laughs> from hot, yeah, I mean, uh, it's very much the case that, yeah, ev every book has to be commercially viable and its, it, its PLs, its budgets are based, its advances are based on its acquisition figures and, th and there are tight budgets to meet and so, and so it is tough. And so there are a number of books where if we aren't able to secure um, funding, support, grants, those authors won't be visiting the UK. Um, 
but that's why we turn to social media and online opportunities as much as we can um, and we work with their translators and we work with um, where we know there might be a journalist, a stringer out there that we can you know, that we can try and sort of get to go and interview them if it's not possible in every country but sometimes it is but we have to work around it as much as we can because it, it really isn't possible you know, when you have a, a list that is, you know, publishes so many writers, you, you simply can't afford to bring them all over. Um, that's true. I think Chad Post had an excellent um, kind of breakdown of this on the 3% blog, which Alex has seen, I know, as well. And it, it's instructive, I think, for, for translators and, and anyone working in publishing to look at the kind of hardcore numbers of how do you make a profit on a book when you've paid a large portion um, to the translator, um, which the translator deserves because they've done that work. Um, in some cases, as a translator, I've had a publisher say to me, we would like to do this book, but we actually need to wait to find out until the funding is available um, before we want, we can't get you to start without knowing because we can't afford to foot the bill on our own. And that's certainly more and more true for small independent publishers who have a, a really, um, you know, the overhead is significant and it can't be spread around. So that's one of the things that we've been talking about at the Pen Translation Committee, actually, if, um, your overhead is above a certain level, then only 75% of the cost of the translation would be reimbursed. But if your overhead is below that threshold, then it will be 100% reimbursed. And, and that's a, a recognition of the fact that the economics of publishing are very, very difficult for small publishers. Next question. There, right there, <laughs> right, you see, yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Carolyn, and I was just wondering on this uh, subject, what sort of numbers are we actually talking about? How many books do you have to sell for it to be a success, or is that classified information? <laughs> well, um, it's not classified information, but it, it, it's very much dependent on the advance you paid for it, the, the, the literally the length of the book, because that's going to depend on, on the, the cost of the translation. Um, and, uh, you know, yes, yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it's different for every book, you know. A thousand copies might make you, you might break even. It might be 2,000 copies. You might need to sell 25,000 copies. It, it's sort of, the economics are dependent on the scale and, and really. Um, it's it's, it's funny this is... Case basis. Yeah. I'm sorry. No? It's funny this is coming up now, two questions in a row, but I will say I did just recently do a podcast. If you go to pen.org slash translation, uh, there is, and you scroll down the bottom of the left-hand column, there's a transcript of a podcast called Translators, Rates, Money, and Unions, where I spoke with... Chad Post, who's the publisher of Open Letter Books, which is a nonprofit publisher of literary translation in the United States, and um, Tom Roberge, who um, has been a bookseller for New Directions, an independent publishing house of literary translations in the United States. And in that podcast, um, we talk about uh, the, we do a breakdown of the economics of publishing a kind of sample book in translation based on you know assumption of a certain number of words certain number of pages certain number of copies printed and the whole uh, and, and again as Beth Ann said it depends on the length of the book um, among other things and how much you pay the translator how much it costs you to print the book but mostly it depends on the length of the book and you can get an idea of what the economic breakdown is for publishing a book but it does vary and I'll also um, add that when we see the applications for the Pen Translation Grants um, and the Pen Promotes Grants, the vast majority of the books that are applying are a print run of 2,000, 3,000, maybe 4,000 copies. It's very seldom that we see an applicant that's planning to a print run of eight or nine or 10,000. I was just going to say that, you know, And Other Stories generally goes with 2,000 uh, print run. 
And um, we've obviously got subscribers that, you know, most of that print run, go, well, not actually most, but uh, that some of that print run will go to. Um, so let's say of the 2,000, we've got at least about like 800 subscribers. Um, and then the rest of them either goes out to, uh, you know, the media or um, friends of and, um, and, then, and, uh, and then the trade. And basically, we consider a book a success when, you know, we've sold out of the, that 2,000 and we've then had to go and reprint, which then obviously costs us more money, but it's obviously worth it because there is a demand on that book. And some of our books then go on to resell again. So at that point, we will consider putting them into a, um, a mass market paperback, which makes the book cheaper, but means that we can then continue to publish more at a, at a a more affordable cost, I guess, and, and continue to, to publish. So, you know, and that's that's a brilliant success for us, you know, but I don't know if it actually financially balances out, you know, just it depends. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two, maybe two more questions. All right, if there are no more questions, I'll give you all a chance to say, you know, any last words. Um, that you want to ask <laughs> <That's really laughs> not, not, as if oh you haven't spoken God. enough. Um, I have last words, um, which is that um, English Pen actually has a table in the, the back part of the Literary Translator Center here. And if you have further questions, you can find me or you can find Erica Yarnes, who's our program manager, um, who will be here throughout the course of the fair, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about the Pen grants program at English Pen. So, um, if there are no further questions, let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you for joining us.